All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Getting Ahead by Deleting Code, which is a prospect I'm sure you're all super excited to hear more about. Because who doesn't like deleting stuff? Uh, well, and more importantly, who doesn't like getting ahead in their career as well? Uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, you're going to learn how those two things kind of work together and what you should be doing so that you can uh, build your career a little bit more, kind of get to that next level, get to that senior level status if you want or whatever. Uh, I'm joining you with my bathrobe on from the chilly Pacific Northwest today. A little rainy, kind of on brand for October out here. Uh, I know most of us were uh, pretty excited to be attending a, an in-person event around this time in um, in Nashville. But I'm glad you're all here with us virtually today and wherever you might be recording the or viewing the recording in the future. Uh, so with that said, let's get at it. I am Thomas Rainer. I work at Microsoft on a team that manages... Uh, a bunch of high security environment infrastructure for a handful of different services. Um, that's not really what we're here to talk about. I'm a senior security service engineer, uh, and I'm, so I'm a senior person on my team. Uh, one of my responsibilities is helping uh, mentor junior members of our team and uh, in kind of upskill everybody as much as I can. And I think that's the expectation really of everybody on a team to kind of contribute to that process. But definitely anyone you talk to about senior level expectations, mentorship is going to play a role in that. Helping improve others is going to play a role in that. And you'll kind of see why I'm referring to that and uh, make that connection as we as we get into this. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Mr. Thomas Rayner. Uh, connect with me there is a great way to get in touch with me. Also, the PowerShell Discord and Slack network, aka.ms slash PS Discord and PS Slack, uh, they're bridged. It's the same network. Uh, highly recommend you check that out uh, get over there. There's a lot of people who uh, are willing to help you if you have problems uh, or get help from you if you have solutions. And uh, it's a great place full of like-minded individuals who uh, all want to kind of get along and, and make each other better. It's a great spot to be. You should definitely check it out if you're at all interested in PowerShell. <laughs> So let's talk about how some people measure developer impact. Because if you're going to get ahead in your career, then you should think about how you're being measured. What are the metrics that you're being compared to? Good metrics are related to the problems solved by a coded solution. So that means things like, what did you make faster? What did you make safer? Whose job is easier because of the solution you created and delivered? Uh, who is more effective because of what you created? It's great to say, oh, I wrote um, this script, period. But it's better to say, I wrote this script and because it exists, we're less likely to um, experience a data breach. We're handling our users' credentials in a safer way. We experience a quicker onboarding of new accountants because of the thing that I did. Those are all good ways to measure the impact of a developer is what did your uh, product, what did your code actually do? A bad way to measure developer impact, a lot of the bad metrics people use are related to the code itself, like the code itself matters. So that's things like how many scripts did you write? How many commits did you make? How many branches of in this repository are you responsible for? That is not a good way to evaluate the impact of a developer, right? It sounds obvious when you say it out loud, but there's too many people out there being evaluated the wrong way instead of the right way. Things like how many lines of code did you write is a bad way of determining if somebody was a good developer or a bad developer. It's, just, it's common sense when you think about it, but there's too many people being evaluated that way. And so this, how many uh, lines of code did you write is kind of the premise for this uh, for this session, right? How many, uh, let's delete code, let's reduce the number of lines of code we're responsible for and get ahead in our career by doing it. It's a little counterintuitive if this is how you think of developer performance. If you're thinking the developer who wrote a thousand lines of code is higher performing than the developer who wrote a hundred lines of code and that's all you're basing that decision off of, you're doing it wrong. And you shouldn't think about productivity and impact that way. We're going to talk a little bit more about how to think about impact and how to 
uh, kind of have, to borrow a Microsoft phrase, a growth mindset about this whole type of thing and grow your career and those of others as you do it. So stay tuned. It's going to be exciting. You're already excited, I can tell. <laughs> and a provocative statement that I kind of like to make is, in my career, I have written and I'm responsible for a net negative number of lines of code. You know, how is that even possible? How can you possibly be responsible for a negative amount of code? So like, how am I counting these lines of code, right? Let's think first about refactoring old code. Anytime you push code to production, that's lines of code that you've delivered. Say you wrote a 200 line script and pushed it to production. It's running in production. You wrote 200 lines of code. Great. Now to kind of think about what Steven's doing here. I like rewriting old code to make it testable. Erase the old shame. No one has to know except everyone watching this session. So sorry, Steven. Thanks for letting me use your tweet. Um, you are going to know. You know what you wrote earlier in your career. You know what exists in your environment that's existed for years when people didn't really know what they were doing as well. Go back, refactor it, turn that 200 line thing into 150 lines, and now you can trim 50 lines off of your total. You've subtracted 50 lines. So anytime you go and refactor code and make it simpler, make it more concise and get rid of code, you're reducing the number of lines of code that you've written. Take those out refactor somebody else's code now you're working in the negative space and you're making other people's code better helping other people optimize your code in, for the sake of my funny accounting here uh, think about doing a code review somebody's about to push out a change to production uh, this script is going to be 500 lines and you give feedback to simplify and optimize it and rearrange it in a way where now it's only 450 lines there's another 50 lines for your negative tally. And that's sort of how I'm counting in this way uh, how many lines of code I'm responsible for. If I prevent a code, a uh, line of code from going to prod, that's negative one line of code that I'm responsible for. And that's sort of the premise of this talk is write better code, refactor your old code, help other people write better code. And it kind of tends to be less code out there that's how you're going to write less code and get ahead by doing it. Let's dive in because let's talk more about this premise and the whole fact that better code tends to be fewer lines. Like, let's not get into code golf here. If you know what that is, it's uh, writing is solving the problem presented with the fewest number of characters possible. And you get into all these weird ways of manipulating languages that are unintended <laughs> most of the time. Uh, and you get into really sloppy, ugly, hard to maintain code. That's code golf. We don't want that. You should, if a line of code belongs in your script or your solution, write it. It should be there. Like we're still producing code, right? But, as a habit, as a pattern, the more uh, concise your code is, the more um, performant it is, the fewer dependencies it has, it tends to be fewer lines of code. Fewer lines of code is usually less complex, uh, more maintainable from uh, by your peers. Less can go wrong when fewer lines of code are there. It's sort of common sense again, but that's not really how people always think about it. And so I know it sounds like I'm advocating to stop writing code, not the case at all. I'm advocating for writing better code, writing code that is uh, faster, less com uh, complicated, takes fewer dependencies. That's the type of thing that I'm advocating for here. So let's talk about how you learn to write code because like there's sort of two paths, right? Like there's the self-taught path and there's the uh, post-secondary institution path. Like some people learn to write code by going to college and paying a post-secondary institution uh, a few dozen thousand dollars uh, to get a computer sciences degree. And they come out of it learning how to, uh, having learned how to write code. If you're coming from kind of an ops background, you're more of a PowerShell person, you are probably learning by doing and you're learning on the job and you're maybe you watch some courses, but uh, this next part is kind of more tailored towards the non-degree part. However, it's going to apply because anyone with a comp sci degree knows you don't graduate with all the knowledge you need to write great code. That comes with practice. So let's get in. What are some beginner habits 
beginner habits, especially when you're talking about like PowerShell and uh, other interpreted languages, you're trying stuff out in the console. Uh, oh, how do I delete a user? Oh, is it do, uh, remove ad user dash whatever? Like, and, okay, that worked. I'm gonna copy and paste that into my script. Okay, cool. I wrote a line of code. Awesome. Uh, you kind of just figure it out by doing, you piece things together that are barely functional uh, and you don't really organize your code in a way that might make sense, but it works and that feels great and you keep going at it that way until you learn better. That's a beginner habit. Uh, another beginner habit is uh, listening to a person who knows more or your stakeholder who is describing the problem and they go, oh yeah, you're gonna have to connect to the system, you're gonna have to perform this calculation, you're gonna have to perform that calculation, uh, and then you're gonna have to perform this operation. Uh, and that's all I needed to do. And then you go and you write your code and you connect to the system and you perform the calculation, you perform the other calculation, uh, and then you perform the operation, whatever the fourth thing was. Um, when in reality, as you grow and you learn about uh, translating the customer request into a proper uh, programmed solution, you might have been able to go, oh, this is going to perform a lot better if I perform this calculation differently, if I perform it before I even connect to that system. Oh, yeah, I'll organize it a little differently, accomplish all that person's goals in a different way. Beginners don't necessarily think about it that way. They think very procedurally. I need to do this, then I need to do that, then I need to do this other thing. These are my business outcomes as I'm checking them off the list. Uh, but they're not necessarily thinking about translating those requirements into a good program or a good script. There's that, um, that, there's that determination missing, very beginner habit. And as such, beginner code quality is normally low. And that's fine. That's expected. It's supposed to be. You're starting out. You're learning. It'd be great if it was higher, but it's not. You're writing your first scripts. You're writing your first programs. You're writing your first code. And you're learning how to do it right. You're learning by doing on the job. And that's fine. So it's going to be low, which is why it's important to have other people check it. Whether it's you in the future once you've learned more and you're refactoring the old stuff, or whether it's a senior person on your team, uh, or whether it's somebody in the community who can take a quick look and make sure that you have your head screwed on straight, it's important to understand that when you're new at this, the code won't be as good. It sounds obvious again, but you have to expect that and cater to it because you want the product to be as good as possible, even though the person writing it is learning when they're doing it. So how do you grow? How do you get better? Well, by doing more of it, by looking at other people's examples, by reading other people's blogs, by watching other people's videos, by writing more code yourself, by not giving up, by trying more stuff, by getting your code reviewed, you're going to do better. You're going to grow. You stick with it. You learn these habits and they accumulate over time. And all of a sudden you're not a beginner anymore. You're writing better code already which is awesome and it's very organic and it's the way most of us end up progressing whether you have a degree or not as soon as you get into the industry or as soon as you start contributing to open source you find oh every time i write some code i learn something about writing code and it's that organic growth that kind of drives you but you have to start thinking like where are you learning all these things from You've had mentors along the way, whether you realize it or not. The person whose blog you are reading is a mentor to you in a very transactional, brief, anonymous way. They gave you a little bit of mentorship and knowledge. Uh, you asked a question on Stack Overflow. Well, if it got answered without hurting your feelings too badly, that person mentored you really quickly. Maybe your boss is a mentor. Maybe there's senior people on your team who are mentors. Maybe there's people in the community you chat with and bounce ideas off of a lot. Those are mentors. So who are you mentoring is sort of where we're going with this. Because where are you now? Are you a senior in your career and you uh, are writing senior level code and you're performing senior level activities? Awesome. Listen, because I'm going to show you the tricks and secrets to accelerating your career past that point. Are you ready to be a senior? You might be closer than you think. Everybody's got knowledge that they can be sharing, whether they acknowledge it or not. Uh, there's some good books written on the topic. Uh, Don Jones' Be the Master is a good one you should check out, kind of about the master-apprentice mentorship relationship. 
Um, but you have more to share than you think you uh, than you might think you do, and you should definitely be engaging in these activities early in your career, no matter if you're a senior or not. Definitely, if you're a senior. But no matter what stage you're at, you should be thinking about this stuff because it's going to accelerate your career growth. As you grow, you write more efficient solutions, period, right? Like usually, obviously, there's exceptions to every rule. Some people write bad code forever. But how did you learn what you know today? You weren't born with this knowledge. You learned it somehow, whether you read a blog or you had a mentor or whatever, uh, a formal relationship. You learned it from somebody. So what are you doing to pass that knowledge on to other people? How are you improving those around you? How are you helping your team get better at their jobs? How are you helping the community at large and newcomers to the community accelerate their career growth and write better solutions themselves? What are you doing? It's worth reflecting on because... When you increase the amount of impact you have on other people, you are in part responsible for some of the impact that they have. If you teach somebody how to fish, then every fish they catch is in small part a product of the teaching and the wisdom that you imparted on them. Obviously, they're the ones out there fishing. They're putting in the work. They're doing all the work to catch the fish. But if they would have never known how to catch fish without you, you're responsible for their growth. And now, if you're both out there catching fish, you're catching twice as many than you would if you were the only one out there catching fish. Follow the metaphor. If you can increase the impact of other people, that's good impact for you. That reflects well on you. If you're the person that everybody learns from, you're empowering their growth. And that is kind of what we're going to be talking a lot more about in this session. You're going to get ahead because you're the one who makes everybody else around you better. Sound exciting, right? You don't even have to know how to code to do that, although it kind of helps if that's what you're trying to teach everyone else how to do. This is the key to growing your career even further than if you could just write the best code in the world. So let's Revisit our initial question. Also, as an aside, I can't believe that this picture was Creative Commons, although the Bing and uh, the integrated background image search said that it was. So that's, that's me saying that it's okay. But let's revisit the original question. What is it you say you do here? When you're trying to uh, have your performance review, what is your value to the organization? Well, it's the, we're trying to get ahead in our careers here, right? Like, let's measure our impact effectively. We want to grow in our careers. We want to get ahead. We want to get promotions. We want to get raises. We want to get uh, more for us. If you're complacent and good where you're at, well, then you're done growing and I guess you're just dead. But if you're like most of us and you want to get ahead, you want to continue growing, you want to improve, you have to increase your impact somehow. So how do you evaluate that impact? Lines of code is a terrible metric to evaluate developer productivity. I wrote 500 lines of code. Great, but half of them were comments, which are valuable. Uh, if you chose a different bracing style, it would have been half of that. Uh, or it, like Number of lines of code tells you jack all about if someone's a good developer or not, right? Were they uh, 100 lines of good code or 100, 100 lines of code that expose your user database to the entire world and uh, make people's credit card information vulnerable? There's a difference between good code and bad code, and we shouldn't treat them all the same. We should think about solution-based metrics. Whose life did I improve? The people in finance are now able to do their jobs with 50% uh, less chin-ups than they did before. I don't know. Think about it. Like, what difference in the world did your code make? And if the answer is nothing, well, then why'd you write it? Think harder. Really connect it to a business goal. What does your business do? How did the code you write make it better. Well, we have this entire line of business where they screw toothpaste to, uh, they screw the caps on the toothpaste tubes. And I made it so that they can do that twice as fast. Well, great. That's the punchline. I doubled the productivity of these people. Not, I wrote a script. I doubled the productivity of these people by writing a script is the sentence you kind of want to go with there. 
So what happens when you get things like, well, we're not developers, we're just ops people, we don't want to be responsible for that code, oh, we don't know how to do that. Like we have a team full of people who doesn't know how to write code. Uh, we, we, we just aren't capable. Uh, we have people on our team who are, oh, they're, they're, they're close to retiring. They're not going to learn a new trick. The answer to all of that is make better people, upskill them, uh, mentor them, teach them, share knowledge. If you have devs who don't have time for, or ops who don't want to be devs, well, you have to motivate them and show them why this is important because I think by now most of us see the writing on the wall that if you're not writing a little bit of code, you're not going to have a really long ops career. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. You have to be able to at least write some code. You don't have to be a full-blown dev or whatever people want to talk about, but if you write code, you are a dev. If you write code, you're performing development activities. In that moment, you're a dev. Whether you're a good dev or not uh, is up for debate. Whether you're a professional dev is up for you to decide. But if you're writing code, you're performing development activities, which makes you a dev. And if you have people on your team who aren't contributing to that process, improve them. Help share the information with them that got you where you're at. Help teach them the skills that you're using to be successful because if you have more people on your side working towards your goals, then you're going to achieve the same goals faster and with more effectiveness than if you were doing it alone. You need to make the people around you better. Otherwise, you're just one person struggling against the, the stream of apathy and, and, uh, and complacency. You have to win people over, help them understand why this is important, and then give them all the tools that you wish you'd had or that you did have to improve them and help make them better so that they can join you on this mission. You're going to get ahead in your career by having allies. You're going to get ahead in your career by making other people better and empowering their impact and by being the linchpin of productivity on your team. So you're going to be a mentor. We've already decided. There's no two ways about it. You are going to be a mentor. So let's just talk about the type of mentoring relationships. It, by now, it's obvious that this is the path forward to grow in your career. Yeah, you can learn different skills and you can, oh, I'm going to pick up Python. I'm going to pick up TypeScript. I'm going to learn C Sharp. And you should. Growing your technical skills is important. But obviously, by now, empowering your team and being a leader in terms of knowledge sharing and training is going to go a lot further than, hey, oh, I picked up a little bit of beginner Python. You see how this works, right? And so there's millions of different kinds of mentoring relationships. Whether you pick up any different book about mentorship, you're going to learn uh, all these different types of relationships you can have and all these different labels you can apply. And just, it, it's overwhelming. I'm going to talk about two types of like buckets you can kind of file mentoring relationships into. And that's official relationships and unofficial relationships. And by official, I just mean formal, organized. The mentor and the mentee both acknowledge that they're in a mentorship relationship, that you are assigned to mentor somebody, or you're somebody's manager. You are uh, been on a team for three years. Somebody's just joined the team. You are in an official mentorship relationship with them to help get them onboarded. Um, and, and it's something that you can build a process around if that works for you or whatever. But it's acknowledged, accepted by all parties. We're mentoring now. Unofficial relationships are organic. It could be like a mentorship circle where nobody's really an identified mentor versus mentee where you all learn from each other. It's a circle of peers. It's a group DM that you just kind of keep on the side and people come with problems and they discuss. Everyone kind of gets better for the fact that they have it. Um, it's the person who reviews your code on the open source project that just happens to be in charge of that repository, etc. cetera. Um, this is all just kind of organic, unofficial mentorship relationships. Those are the kind of two buckets that they fall into. And I want you to think about your mentorship style. Do you kind of like defined relationships or undefined relationships? What works better for you? You should think what works best for them, but you've, you're a party to this too. So what do you want to do? What would you like to uh, embark upon in this journey? And so it's good to be flexible. Right, Because as much as it's about what your level of comfort is, 
people have different styles of learning. Some people are auditory. They like listening to stuff, like listening to a lecture. They're visual. They'd rather read a book or they're kinesthetic, which means they'd rather get hands-on learning. They'd rather touch and feel something. A lot of people in tech are this way, where they like to dive into the code or they like to run it on their own machine. Uh, and that's how they like to learn. Not everybody learns that way. So just because you like the book and, oh, yeah, give me the manual. I'll memorize it and I'll be good. Doesn't mean everyone else learns that way. And so you have to be flexible and able to accommodate that. You don't have to push yourself too far out of your comfort zone, but everyone has different ways of learning. Everybody has different ways of communicating. Uh, some people like really blunt conversations. They, hey, come here, let me pull you aside by the arm. Uh, this is something that you did wrong. This is why it was wrong. This is how I think you should do it better in the future. Okay, good talk. Everybody feels great. Oh, okay, sweet. I learned about something I did wrong. I'm going to be better next time. I'm really glad that I got pulled aside and I learned that from that person. Other people would be crushed to have a blunt conversation that way. They would walk away from that going, I did something wrong. Oh, and they were so blunt and upfront about it. Maybe they were rude. I think that was rude for them to talk to me that way. Uh, and whether you are in the first group or the second group, some people prefer different methods of communication. Some people would like to have face-to-face -face meetings and can't right now and it's hard for them. So they want webcam to webcam meetings. Some people would rather just have asynchronous chats with you. And so uh, think about what works well for you. Think about what's going to be most effective for the person you're mentoring and try to cater to them. If you're flexible, you're going to reach more people. If you do a blog and a user group and you wrote a book, you're going to hit way more people than if you're just the guy who cranks out books. You know, I tend to connect with people in a casual way. I like to kind of just talk to somebody as if we're friends, we're peers, uh, get to know what their motivations are. And then I kind of like kinesthetic learning myself. I like diving into things. And I kind of like throwing people into the fire and seeing if they're able to figure it out themselves as well. Give them a problem. Hey, try this out. Let's regroup and talk about the solutions we came up with. But not everybody works that way. And you have to be ready to say, uh, oh, what I want to do by default isn't what's going to work for this person. Uh, maybe we should have a conversation about learning styles. And uh, I'll discover that they really like reading and I'll be able to recommend them the book that I think is really good. So I kind of by default prefer an unofficial, casual, uh, kinesthetic style of mentorship. But that's not, that's not going to be what works for everybody. So now you're probably going like, oh, yeah, this is great. I'm going to make everyone around me better. I'm going to get ahead of my career by doing it. This is a win-win situation. Everybody's going to get uh, a big boost from this. Uh, what do I actually want to do now? Uh, how am I, how am I going to put rubber to the road as it were and improve these people? Like, I guess I have to go start doing this. Let's talk about some ideas that you can do right now for free. The first one is code reviews. Uh, because you know, like all the code that you push out to production is reviewed before it gets there, right? Obviously it is. You nobody would ever write code and run it in production without having somebody else look at it first, right? Well, okay, let's just implement a code review process if you don't already have one because it's a phenomenal learning opportunity and it's a great mentorship opportunity. Plus, you know, like it's good change control as well. So you should definitely be doing this. So what do you do in a code review? In this kind of scenario, you're the person reviewing other people's code. You're the reviewer. Somebody else on your team has written code, which is great. You love it. Now you're reviewing it before it goes into production. What do you do? The first is to review it thoroughly. You can't just rubber stamp these. You need to understand every line of code and understand the context that it runs in and the impact that it has on production before you approve it right? If you just go through and take their word for it, oh, I don't know how that works, but I'm sure it's fine. You're hurting the person's learning. If you're not uh, clear on how a piece of code works, probably neither are they. Maybe they copy and pasted it from somewhere else. Maybe this is code is going to run in an environment that doesn't work in a way that the uh, author of the code assumes that it will. You need to understand how it works, understand where it runs, and that, yeah, that takes more time than just scrolling through and making sure they didn't hard code any passwords. But this is more valuable for you and for them. Uh, 
It protects you from the change management perspective, but it also allows you to properly review their code and give them uh, feedback that's valuable, not just looks good to me, and then the rocket emoji that says you should ship it. Uh, keep your priorities together, right? In order, and this is my order, the first thing your code needs to do is function correctly. So what are the goals of the code? Oh, it's supposed to clean up stale users in Active Directory. Okay, great. Does it do that? <laughs> like one, like number one, did it delete any users that it wasn't supposed to? Did it delete all the users it was supposed to? Great. It performed its function. That's job number one. Then is it clean and maintainable? Can somebody else come along after me and uh, understand how this code, code is organized? Did I put comments in explaining the weird numbers or whatever that I hard coded? Um, can somebody maintain this code going forwards? Yes or no? Um, and guess what? The person maintaining that code could be you six months from now. Because let me tell you, six months from now, Thomas is not going to recognize a lot of the code that Thomas of today wrote. And uh, making code that's maintainable isn't just for the other people on your team. It's also for you. And it's really important to make that a, a priority. The other third thing is make sure that it's optimized. There's a reason you don't want to do triple nested for eaches uh, and a whole like wait for a job to complete when you don't have to, etc. Like all these things that you do in PowerShell that you aren't supposed to do, or just in any coding language that are inefficient. Uh, try to optimize. Try to make it run as quickly as possible. Use as few resources as it needs. Um, you're gonna have to make trade-offs here, right? Like, would you rather have something that's clean and maintainable or optimized? Sometimes you have to make choices, uh, and you'll have to compromise on some of these things. But those are the priorities. Make sure that all three of those things are considered. It's not enough just for it to work. It's not enough just for it to be fast. It has to be all these things. Make sure in, when you're reviewing code that you're asking questions instead of making statements. It's not as valuable to go, this is bad, you should do it this way. It's more valuable to go, uh, I, have you considered doing this? Uh, I wonder why you chose to do it that way. And like, you're getting the same point across. You identified something that you don't necessarily like and you're finding, uh, or you're offering a solution, but ask the question instead of make the statement, it's less likely to hurt somebody's feelings and it's a little less confrontational, which like, hey, oh, there's no room for feelings in tech. Sure there is. This is a human business and you should treat it that way. Accordingly, Make sure you're articulating the problem if there is one and you're suggesting an alternative. If your comment just says, this is bad uh, or, oh, I don't like this, that's a useless comment. Like they, they're going to read that and go, okay, but why? Well, because it's a variable you declared that you didn't use. Oh, I should just remove it and then I can move on. Oh, okay. Uh, this is a learning opportunity for the person who wrote the code. And they're going to learn something either way. They're either going to learn that you care about their growth and that there's a better way of doing something, or they're going to learn that you don't care at all and that they are on their own in their learning journey. And whether or not they learn the better way of doing something, well, let's see if they do or not. You can either put them on the right path and help them, or you can just leave them to their own devices and hope they get it right on their own eventually. Which would you rather be? Which type of person would you rather have on your team? Make sure you don't just point out bad stuff that's broken. Make sure if there's a well-written piece of code that you call it out and you go, oh, this was really smart. Oh, I like the way you did this. Hey, this is something that I know I commented on in your last code review that you did correctly and improved upon this time. Awesome, good for you for learning, right? Like it's important to reinforce good behavior as much as it is to um, stop and prevent bad behavior. You want them to keep doing the things they're doing well not just stop doing the things they're doing wrong. So reinforce that. Plus, people are a lot less likely to dread your code reviews if you're actually helpful and if you're actually uh, nice to get along with and point out the wins as well. Make sure you follow up. You absolutely have to follow up on code reviews. You can't just give a review and then vanish into the night, never to be seen again. Because uh, they're going to have questions about stuff. You, you want to make sure that, hey, I put you on this learning path How'd that work out? Did you learn? Oh, good. No. What was the problem? Well, I can be better. Uh, I can be a better mentor if you tell me what some of my deficiencies were. How do we do here? Let's follow up. Let's make sure that the code uh, is the best quality that it can be. 
and uh, and stay on this learning journey that you're on. Because it is. As much as this is a change control tool, as much as this is about making sure that bad code doesn't make it to prod, this is as much or more about making developers better and helping people learn to write better code and teaching them to do it. So like that's as much as an important, that, that's as much your priority in a code review as it is about doing change control. Code reviews, awesome way to uh, mentor others and help them improve uh, because you're talking about code that they wrote. Very tangible example for them. Uh, group learning is another good one. Uh, you can do things like uh, solve problems together. I like doing this. Uh, the PS Coans, 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 Coans uh, is a module written by Joel. A lot of you know him. It's a great module, aka.ms slash PS Coans. Uh, you can learn about it and download it. Uh, there are problems written in PowerShell. Uh, you, you fix broken pester tests to learn how PowerShell works. Uh, and so you can go through them as a group. That's sort of the point here, right? You can do iron scripter problems as a group and talk about them and uh, discuss your process of uh, troubleshooting and problem solving and determining what the true requirements are. Uh, Leak code, Project Euler, and Advent of Code are not PowerShell specific like the first two, but they're written to be done in a variety of languages, and you should absolutely tackle some of those as you're getting a little bit more advanced. Learn things about data structures and algorithms and optimizing code and uh, get together, solve them independently and discuss your solutions or work through them in a classroom setting, whatever it is. Find these similar problems that you can all work on together and do it as a group activity. Put them in context of your uh, organization or of your uh, general outward community. Uh, and you'd be surprised at how helpful it is to uh, work through these hands-on activities together. Keep in mind, like, what are your goals? Right? Like, are you just trying, like, somebody's brand new, uh, they open PowerShell console and they're like, whoa, the background's blue. I thought the Windows console was black. Like, is that where you're starting? Because maybe uh, PS coins and you doing them in front of the person who's learning is a good place to start. Are you already writing some code and you're trying to get through the concept of writing more performant code? Maybe you want to go uh, investigate some of the leak code questions related to code performance and how to do things in a correct algorithmic way. In almost every case, you don't want to just lecture people. Right? Like, don't just sit in front of them and solve the problem and then shut down your conference, right? Like, if you're doing these virtual sessions right now that a lot of people are having success with, if you're just doing the problem, describing it to them, and they're not engaged, they're not doing the problem too, they're not even listening to you. They have you minimized as they're scrolling through Twitter or whatever. Make sure they're engaged. Make sure they're doing the problem too. Everybody goes away and does the problem, and then we get together every week and discuss our mutual solutions. Okay, great. Um, you can provide leadership and guidance, but don't be the only one talking. Uh, peer programming is excellent and is more of a one-on-one -on -one collaboration than, uh, than a group collaboration most of the time. Because this is working on real life code together, not like Iron Scripter or PS Coins or Leak Code, but your actual work items that you're tasked with delivering, uh, you're gonna work on with somebody else rather than in isolation. Uh, this is something that you used to just do with like two people in an office, but we're not really in enclosed spaces together right now. So Visual Studio Live Share is a great solution for this. And uh, Mark Krauss does, did a session on this um, a year ago, two years ago. I don't remember now because uh, what is time even? It's lost all meaning. Uh, but Mark, Mark Krauss did a session on uh, pure programming and he highlighted a lot of the good stuff in Visual Studio Live Share. Uh, but what it does is it's a plugin for Visual Studio Code, which is where you should be writing all your PowerShell and most of your other languages too, uh, that allows you to connect on the same uh, code base and both of you work at the same time. It's like collaborating on a Google Doc or a Word online document. You can see everybody's cursor together. You can kind of see it in the background of this slide that Amanda Silver um, cursor flag is where Amanda is working in this document with whoever is hosting her. Um, get it, install it, connect to each other, and now, hey, we're both looking at the exact same code, working on it together. 
both of you have got to be engaged. You've got to both be working on the code together, right? Like it just doesn't do anyone any good if you're doing it all and the person who's supposed to be learning is got their eyes closed, isn't looking, scrolling through Twitter again, right? You have to both be engaged, both be talking, both be problem solving, both be writing code. This is a collaborative effort, not a lecture. And so then you go, okay, well, maybe they should do all the work while I sit there and watch them. Maybe. Uh, but you have to think about, am I leading the charge here? Or is my peer, is my the person that I'm mentoring leading the charge here? Because it's valuable for them to see your workflow and see how you tackle problems. You have more experience, presumably, if you're the mentor. Um, you, what do you do when you're confronted with this coding problem? How are you addressing it? And that can be valuable learning experiences. But... You can't just spoon feed everything to them either. You need to observe their process uh, and get them hands-on activity, um, hands-on experience. You have to do things together and watch them uh, lead the charge so that you can kind of provide guidance and uh, help them avoid obstacles and unblock them on the fly. But they're the ones doing it. They're the ones leading the charge. Both approaches have value. You can alternate between both of them in the same session, but just be aware. Am I the one doing all the work here and they're not learning? Or are we working on this together and everything's good and uh, happy? Or are they doing all the work and struggling while I listen to my cats fighting in the background of me trying to give a presentation? You know, like, you get the idea. <laughs> One-on-one -on -one meetings are great. Um, these are often something that you have in formal, official mentorship relationships because they're just specific one-on-one -on -one meetings between people where you talk with the express purpose of uh, having that connection, that one-on-one -on -one meeting, and making one person a mentor or the other person the mentee and, uh, and discussing and growing. It doesn't have to be that official. You can have one-on-one -on -one conversations and meetings and just, oh, yeah, I'd like to get coffee and talk about this piece of code that you wrote. Okay, that's a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Uh, oh, hey, I'd like to set up just a recurring thing with you uh, and, uh, and talk about how your learning journey is going because I want to be involved and support you as best I can. Either of you can ask for one. If you're the mentor, you can lead the charge and just say, hey, I'd like to, I know you're working really hard at growing in this area. Um, and I, if I can help, I'd like to be a part of that. Let's set up a, a monthly or biweekly sync and just let me help you keep you on track. Have them on a schedule. Or they can ask you, hey, I'd like to pick your brain about these topics, blah, blah, blah. You know, you can have an agenda or not. Either way is cool. Whether you're, um, going to distribute an agenda and say, I'm going to talk about this thing uh, that you wrote. We're going to talk about this book that you were reading. And we're going to talk about managing our expectations with our manager. Okay, great. Uh, or do we just kind of get the coffee and talk about what's top of mind? Some weeks you can have the agenda. Some weeks you can go without the agenda. Again, everybody works a little differently. You can experiment and find out what works best for you. Uh, but the point is, one-on-one -on -one meetings kind of include a little bit of privacy that you don't get in a group setting. Uh, you can conduct these with an expectation of confidentiality uh, or not. Uh, sometimes you're having a one-on-one -on -one meeting with your boss and you know your boss is going to talk about you to their boss or whatever. Um, but you can kind of create an environment of trust and really contribute to that person's learning in a one-on-one -on -one meeting in a way that you can't necessarily do it in these other more public or um, less confidential settings. This is great for trust building. Uh, what are some other ideas? You know, uh, like you don't just have to mentor the people you work with. You can write in a blog, make posts about the things that you're doing at work, as long as you're not giving away the farm there and telling everybody your secrets. Um, but write some posts. People will come by and learn from your uh, posts. You write a blog post about how to open a, a Save As dialog box in PowerShell. And now that gets five hits every day. And those five people every day that learn from your blog are better than they were before. That's Huge. That's empowering five people a day to do something they didn't know how to do before because you took a half hour to write something, put it together, and upload it to the internet. That's awesome impact. It goes up there and lives forever as long as it's relevant. Uh, you create a GitHub page at github.io. Uh, we'll do static hosting for you, static web pages for you. Um, Netlify, a lot of other places. Build a WordPress blog and 
uh, contribute to it as you can. If you're going to blog, try to have a schedule. Not mandatory, though. Uh, speak in public. Again, this isn't for everyone. Not everyone's comfortable speaking in public. But right now, I'm speaking in my spare bedroom. That's become my uh, my office. <laughs> you know, like speak to user groups, uh, give internal brown bag lunchtime sessions to your team, um, do whatever you want, right? Like speaking in public will um, give you an opportunity to give that firsthand knowledge to others and help them grow and really uh, has a dramatic impact on the growth of others. And then being active on social media is great. Like get on Twitter if you're not already there. Engage on Twitter. Reply to people. Like people post on Twitter knowing it's public. You can reply to them. You don't have to know them in order to retweet them or like their tweet or follow them or, you know, like be engaged. Get on the Discord and Slack network and uh, you can just lurk if you want. You can ask questions in the in the help channels. But you can be a person and provide mentorship or just um, – be a member of the community too. That's leadership. That's mentorship, uh, and it'll become obvious to you how to contribute in the within the community if you're active on social media. Uh, your blog can be internal only. You, your speaking sessions can be to your team. Your social media could be uh, Yammer or Teams or whatever, right? Like uh, something that's internal. You don't have to be in public. You can uh, focus on your team first, but you can also focus on public, normal people who you don't already have a relationship with, uh, it's a good way to find a mentor as well. So it's metaphor time again. Uh, don't just seek out a big, sli a, a big slice of a small pie. Try to find a bigger pie. And this analogy is only going to make sense if you understand that the PowerShell community loves pie. We've been going off about it for weeks now. and. I crossed it out, but I do have to say blueberry is the best pie. Yes, pumpkin pie counts as pie, and pie is better than cake. I won't hear anything about it. These are not just my opinions. These are the law. That said, let me explain my analogy, because if you haven't heard it before, it can be a little bit confusing. Let's back up. Let's talk about make sure you get the credit for the work that you do. If you wrote a script and it goes out and has a certain impact on a group of people in your workplace, that is something you should get credit for. I wrote a script and now finance can do their job more safely. Boom, that's a slice of pie for you. That's credit that you get, acknowledgement that you get, impact that you've had, that counts as something that you did that uh, had impact on other people and is a worthy way of evaluating your impact. And it's a worthy way of evaluating your performance. It's what I did, the impact of what I did, and I'm getting my slice of the pie. I'm getting my recognition and my credit for having done that, right? If you're training other people and helping make them better, that's also impact. You're helping other people to be better. They're getting credit for those awesome things that they're doing, but they're doing it because of what you helped them to understand. They're doing it because of knowledge that you imparted. If everybody else is doing good work and they're growing and they're getting credit, there's more credit going around. There's more impact going around. There's more performance going around. The entire team is doing better and it's because of your efforts. You get credit for that too. Like you're allowed to um, talk about in your performance evaluations. Um, yeah, I wrote this code. It had that impact. I also led this series of uh, group activities that has made the rest of the team better at this, that, and the other thing. I also did uh, 18 different code reviews with these three different people on our team, and I taught them about writing more optimized code, and now the code that they write is better. You're not diminishing anybody by doing that. Nobody was ever put down by saying, oh, I learned this from someone else. Like if I'm the mentee, I'm the junior person on the team, and I go, yeah, um, I did this, and it was in large part because I learned from this other person. That doesn't make my impact any less worthwhile. It makes it so that the person who helped me gets due credit for doing what they did. Does that make sense? You want more credit. You want everybody on the team to be successful. You want everybody to um, look to you for help. If, they, uh, if that's the type of relationship that you're looking for, you want to be the linchpin of the training and development and the improvement uh, program for your team. Lots of budgets are slashed right now. 
if you can be an organic way and um, a way that doesn't cost them more money but improves the productivity and uh, of all the other people on your team, that's huge. And that is what elevates you to the next level of your career. It, like, sure, you can be the person who writes the best code in the world, but if you're the person who helps five other people write really good code, I'd rather have five people writing really good code than one 10 time, 10x developer who doesn't talk to anybody who's hard to get along with, who's not sharing knowledge. I want the person who helps everyone get better, not just the person who's focused on themselves. So make the pie bigger. Make it so that everyone's winning. Uh, a rising tide lifts all ships kind of mentality here. If everyone on your team is doing better because of your influence, that's good for them. It's good for you. It's good for everybody. If your impact empowers other people to achieve more, everybody wins, including you, including your organization, including those people. I hope that's clear to you that you don't help anyone when you hoard information. You don't help yourself when you keep knowledge to yourself. You help everybody when you share that knowledge and contribute to their growth and learning. And when you're a recognized teammate that helps other teammates, that is really what senior level uh, individual contributorism is all about. It's not about writing the best code, although that's nice. It's about helping everybody to write better code and having a much larger impact on your team and on your organization that way. So what now? You're going to become a mentor. I just know it. Like, there's no two ways about it. You're becoming a mentor after this, whether you like it or not. I'm sorry to inform you. If you listen to this and you went, no, you're wrong. You're going to become a mentor because you're going to realize that there's all these organic mentorship opportunities that are occurring and you're participating in either way. You're bouncing ideas off of a friend and giving them advice when they asked for it. You are helping onboard the junior member of your team. You are doing code reviews. You're going to be a mentor. And now you're going to know you're being a mentor, and that's going to empower you to do it even better than you've been doing it before. You're going to find mentorship opportunities that work for you and work for your organization. And you're going to be a wonderful mentor. You're going to share knowledge and help others grow. You're going to contribute to the growth of other people's careers, just like other people did for you in some way or another. Uh, it's just going to happen. I know that you have energy for it. You are definitely capable of doing it. If you don't think you can, you're wrong. I Trust me, everybody has the ability to be a mentor and should be doing at least some stuff to make others around them better. And you're going to stop counting lines of code because that's a crappy way to measure developer impact, right? The impact of a developer is measured by their true impact. Like, What did they do to make someone's life better? What do they do to make the company more secure? What do they do to help improve performance? Uh, lines of code? Who cares? Doesn't matter. But you're still going to end up deleting more code anyway because it's the right thing to do. Uh, like perf what good performing code tends to be less lines. So you're going to delete lines of code. You're going to be responsible for other people writing less code because they're going to be writing better code due to your mentorship, due to your influence, because you can help make others better just like other people are helping you become better at this stage in your journey. If you think about it really hard, you'll know that I'm telling you the truth and you know that I'm right and that you have something to offer. You have a perspective that others don't have and you should be sharing it because it's a worthwhile activity. And so that's what's now. That's what's next and that's what you're going to do. I just know it. It's, uh, it's my belief. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to thank you for sharing your time with me and letting me talk to you about mentorship and letting me talk to you about your career. Uh, you can connect with me on Twitter at Mr. Thomas Rayner. If you want to talk more about mentorship or writing code or about security or working at Microsoft, don't hesitate to reach out to me at all. Uh, you can find me on Discord uh, with the same username. Uh, so I hope to see some of you there. Thank you very much for uh, joining me. Thank you to the uh, organizers for putting this on. I know it's kind of hard to put events on right now. Uh, but it's just wonderful that everyone's here and able to share this knowledge with each other. And uh, thank you for giving me a platform to do my part. So with that, take care, everyone. Happy mentoring. And we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.